Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to the IC Interviews. I'm Mary McDougall and I'm delighted to be joined by UK stock picker Alex Wright, manager of Fidelity Special Situation Funds, a well-known fund with £3 billion of assets and manager of Fidelity Special Values Investment Trust, which is up 30% over the past 12 months, double that of its benchmark FTSE All Share Index. The trust has also comfortably outperformed over three, five and ten year periods. Alex began his career at Fidelity as an analyst in 2001 and has been a fund manager since 2008. Alex, this is a very special day because it's the first time I've recorded a podcast with the guest in the studio in person. Thank you so much for coming in. I guess it's handy that our offices are so near each other. How are you? Yeah, very good, thanks. And it is great to be here um, in person. Yeah, we've only had to nip across the road from our office, so not too far to go. <laughs> Well, I thought it might be nice to start with a bit of history. You've been managing Fidelity Special Situations since 2014 and Fidelity Special Values since 2012. You took over both from Sanjeev Shah, but before that, they were managed by the legendary stock picker Anthony Bolton, who, as the FT put it, was the UK's most celebrated stock picker of the 1990s and 2000s. What did you learn from Anthony Bolton and do you still talk to him about investing? Yeah, so it was great to have Anthony um, at Fidelity through all of my early career. And, and certainly I talked to him uh, uh, very much a lot at the time. And then particularly he was in the PM Academy just as I was sort of stepping up to, to manage the small cap fund um, initially. So that was really useful. And then today, while he is now retired, he's still on the Fidelity board um, and still does uh, the odd day of work. So I do I do speak to him, but uh, reasonably irregularly. So probably in the last year, I've spoken to him sort of three or four times, although at times of particular stress, he's really giving up with his time. So actually, when you look at three of those four times I've spoken to him in the last year, they were all in um, sort of uh, April and uh, March and April uh, 2020. So when you have big things that happen in the markets, it's great that Anthony's always giving up his time there, both one on one. So some of those chats were just personally and then also to the, the wider team as well at the time. So I guess he's been busy writing his opera. Now we'll move on to the funds. Both funds are described as having a contrarian stock picking approach. You specifically look for companies that are undervalued or where potential has not yet been recognised by the market. I think it's fair to say that this is similar to a traditional value approach. Um, why does this style of investing appeal to you? So I think um, from my point of view, um, the best way of making money in investment is investing against the consensus. So effectively, I think if people think a company is great, even if its prospects are great, you're already paying for that. So you're, you're not going to make money in normal times by, by just following what everyone else is already doing. So I think you need to be different to produce really great um, investment returns. And that's what being contrarian means. Um, and, and today, particularly, I think being a value investor is really contrarian. Um, and so that, I think, is the best way to encapsulate that, going against the herd, investing in things that people don't think are great, but actually you've identified something that might make people change their minds in future and the stocks will be priced very differently um, uh, once in, that's come through than they are today. So can you explain what your process is for spotting mispriced assets? What, what metrics do you use? So I, I use a lot of different metrics depending on the sector because I think it's um, investments very much an art rather than a science. So different metrics make sense for, for different companies. But I particularly like to look at companies where there's negative opinions and consensus. So I particularly look at broker ratings, so more hold and sell rated stocks, companies that have been underperforming so versus the, the, the market. And then I particularly on the downside like to look at things like EV to sales. So the total enterprise value of the company compared to its sales base and also the, the price of the company compared to its book value. They're particularly useful uh, for working out sort of the, the downside on the company. And clearly it makes a difference between if this is a capital intensive industry where price to book makes much more sense or an asset light or a company that mainly has intangible assets. Their ball will look much more like EV sales on those companies. Yeah, it's interesting. How has the rise of intangibles folded into your investment thinking? So it's interesting. So I, I, I don't think intangibles have really risen. So intangibles have always been part of life. So Coca-Cola would be a great example. You don't value the Coca-Cola brand, but it's clearly really valuable. So some companies have very high returns 
and low asset bases because they have a lot of intangibles either in their brand or their installed base or just because they're people businesses. So like a Circo or a Mighty, for example, in support services have very low in, um, tangible assets because their assets are their people. So that's where you look at EV to sales and, and what the company earns um, on its sales in terms of its margins rather than looking at the price to book, which really makes sense in financials or asset heavy industrial um, companies, etc. I guess the the bane of value investors is value traps. How do you um, how do you avoid them, and how successful are you in doing so? So I think that that's been really key to sort of why our process has still been able to outperform over the the last almost decade that I've been running it in special values, is that even though value has been a really bad place to be that only really sets up the investable set for me. So I don't have to buy every value company in the market. And I particularly try and avoid areas where I think there have been structural changes. So certainly with the, the ever present um, technology and disruption, there clearly are companies and sectors which have been permanently disrupted and therefore low returns today are not going to revert. So we do a lot of work beyond that initial screening for cheap companies that have been doing badly that aren't um, well liked we don't just buy those companies that hope that things will get better we do an awful lot of due diligence around the company and the industry the company's in to really see what we think a catalyst for change will be it's a very time intensive process so generally i i I meet companies myself and we have over 100 in the fund, but then each of those investment ideas will tend to have another four or five follow up meetings where the analyst team will meet competitors, they'll meet suppliers, um, customers, um, they'll do site visits, which is great and now allowed again. Um, they'll, they'll talk to people down the, the company as well, not just the CEO, CFO, to really get a holistic picture of the company and whether the change thesis that management are talking about actually is credible and then importantly they'll continue to monitor that going forward to see if that's actually coming through and so we we'll continue to monitor that on the basis of what management say we really do a lot of further work and i think that's really helped us avoid value traps where things look cheap but actually they don't change positively and the companies just remain cheap yeah that sounds that sounds very sensible um as I was researching, I came across a statement from Warren Buffett in 1979, which was that turnarounds seldom turn um, in, a, in a shareholder letter. Is, is this something you agree with? Um, no, I don't agree with that. So we, we are primarily an um, investor who looks for low returns to, to increase. So we are looking for, for turnarounds. I think it's tougher in bigger companies, and that would be why we would have a very strong mid-small cap bias. So 50% of the funds uh, would be invested below $5 billion, so very much in the smaller end of the market. Because very large companies, it's much harder to change them. And indeed, actually, our process there would be more around industry changes um, and also changes in perception. So the companies may not change significantly, but reasonably small changes can make a big perception change to the valuation. So it is the same process th throughout the market cap spectrum, but I think you get bigger changes and more fundamental changes in more mid and small caps. And also that part of the market is much less well researched. So I think we're at an advantage looking at value stocks because increasingly people don't want to look at value stocks, so less people are looking. But the more down the market cap spectrum you go, the competition weeds out even further because there just isn't the analysis of some of these 500 million, a billion pound companies. And the funds, the funds performed very well recently. How, um, how positive are you on your current opportunity set? So it's been obviously an incredibly unusual environment over the last two years. First of all, with obviously the really painful COVID recession in, in early 2020. But then that, as it often does, like we saw in the global financial crisis or the European banking crisis in sort of 08 and then 2011, these crises often throw up the biggest opportunities because when the market panics, it sells indiscriminately um, and therefore the, the good is thrown out with the, the bad and you can pick up some really great opportunities. And that's why the funds have performed so well over the last 12 months as some of that massive valuation anomaly in even quite good companies has, has started to correct. That said, as you look at the funds today, the absolute value of the funds continues to be really low. So actually the P of 
uh, special values and special sits is about 11 and a half times uh, compared to the market's long-term average of sort of 13 or 14. And indeed, that PE isn't that different from what we were seeing in late 19. So the earnings of the market and the portfolio have really bounced back post-COVID and in many cases are, are higher than they were in 2019. So fundamentals on the ground look really strong and particularly, I would say, in the consumer area. So you've had a reasonably moribund um, consumer economy in the UK for the, the pretty much the five years since the, the, the EU referendum, as there's been a lot of nervousness about political change, regulatory change, and therefore people have been holding off, particularly on some of the bigger ticket items like housing, cars, kitchens, etc. Whereas COVID has both created a much bigger savings pool because people have been restricted from spending on certain things, but also um, because people haven't been doing big ticket spending for five years, there's a bigger pent up demand in the UK than in many other markets um, where actually consumer spending was very strong. Um, and so for me, the fundamentals on the ground are the thing that really excites me, particularly in domestic UK and, and consumer facing stocks. We've had low valuations in the UK for, for the last five years, again, very much EU referendum and Brexit related. But what's good now is that the fundamentals actually look good as well as the valuations. That's been actually very different from what we've been seeing before. OK, and can you give us some examples of what you've been buying and selling recently? <laughs> So uh, along that theme, we've we've very much increased our exposure to retailers. So we always had a couple of these um, pre the, the pandemic. So we already owned Currys um, and we owned Halfords, but we've added um, uh, to those positions. And also we've added in Kingfisher, the, the DIY stock. There's a big stock specific turnaround there with a the new management team that came in like late 19 as well as obviously the, the big spend you're seeing on home improvement because of uh, people increasingly moving house. We've added the UK house builders themselves as well, uh, Red Row and Vistry, on top of the two Irish house builders we already owned, um, and some of the suppliers to those, because I think particularly if you look at the government's agenda, we've been underbuilding on housing in the UK for quite a while, particularly on the more social and affordable housing front. So I think volumes of house building is going to pick up. That's obviously somewhat of a benefit to the house builders, but particularly to suppliers. Um, so we've added Forterra, which is a brick manufacturer, and Brickability, which is a brick distributor. Um, in terms of sales, uh, I'd say the biggest sale through the pandemic was a long-standing position we had in CLS, which has been an excellent uh, performer. So we've we've owned it for about five years and the stock delivered about a 70% return. So a, a decent outperformance over a long period of time. Um, but their business is um, offices. So they're an office landlord. They're, they're also an office developer and they've been very good at churning their portfolio to, to add value. But I think that the big issue is now that one of the really substantial structural changes to the pandemic, which I think is definitely going to stick, is that people are going to work from home more. So it's a question of they probably won't work at home as much as they're doing just right now with clearly fears of the the um, virus and, and obviously the Omicron variant. But I think even just one day a week on average for the average person, you think about that, if the office space is used efficiently, that's a 20%. Um, reduction in the demand for office space. And that's an absolutely huge move because this is an industry where supply obviously doesn't react very quickly to a step down in demand because the offices are still there. So I do think that while values of offices have largely held up so far because most firms aren't exactly sure what they want to do, we've made a point of talking to all the companies we invest in. So probably over <coughs> 250, 300 meetings over the last 18 months and every company, without exception, says they're going to need less office space. They're just not sure how much less. And so I think that is a structural problem for, for office landlords. Yeah. And I think inflation is something that's on a lot of people's minds at the moment. You have um, rising input costs, supply shortages, um, rising cost of labour, things like that. How is this affecting your holdings and what what type of companies might be suffering most from margin pressure? Yeah, so I think what's what's really interesting here is the market's taking a very sort of schizophrenic view to this because 
if inflation is going to become more embedded and particularly sort of labor inflation, which you're seeing quite high rates of now in the UK and US markets in particular, that clearly does need to lead to higher interest rates and higher discount rates. But actually, you're not really seeing a structural move up in, in long term bond yields, nor are you seeing a sort of very highly rated stocks actually see um, their, their prices compressed because people are thinking about higher discount rates. So it's strange that sort of when we talk to companies, it's very clear there are a lot of cost pressures today. And clearly companies that you see cost misses on are being punished badly. So a really good example of that would be Unilever, which is a very big stock in the UK. They're finding it very hard to pass on the the degree of price increases that they're having to because of the cost of goods sold and their labor's going up because there's it's not a particularly discretionary product people aren't spending more on 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 hpc and food goods so they're really struggling but but yet they're not sort of derating some of those very highly rated companies that the natural knock-on effect of high inflation should be for for higher interest rates and if that happens then i guess the financials are the obvious beneficiaries Yes. You have a lot. So definitely, we've got a lot of financials across life insurance, which was the biggest weight in the portfolio, where we've got about a 12% exposure. And then we also do have banks, which are about um, an 8% weight. So those those holdings have been performing reasonably well, but certainly compared to their valuations, I've surprised they haven't performed better, particularly the life insurance stocks, because while the banks... Um, reacted like they would to a normal recession in the COVID recession. So effectively, they axed their dividends and they took very big provisions because of expected loan losses. And therefore, most of the banks didn't produce profit in 2020. And the life insurers produced largely the same profits in 2020 that they did in 2019, because they're much less exposed um, to loan losses because they their balance sheets are in much higher quality bonds. So um, that aren't affected um, in, in the same way in a recession that you would see sort of consumer lending and SME lending badly affected. Um, and their businesses are locked in for the long term because they write annuities and those are for life. Uh, you can't withdraw your, your capital once you've written annuity. So they're, I would say, actually very steady eddy businesses, much more akin to a, a consumer staple stock, but on a massively lower valuation. So they, they still trade like banks on sort of eight to nine times earnings, yielding six to, to 8% um, dividend yields. So that area, I think, is really underappreciated. And while it has performed well, it's still not valued appropriately given its resilience in a, in a recession. And what's the typical holding period for stocks in the fund or maybe what's the fund turnover I guess. yeah so the t- fund turnover tends to be around 40 to 50 percent um but that's more because we we gradually build into positions and then we gradually sell so actually the holding period for each stock is more like um sort of two and a half to three years and generally when we're looking to invest we're thinking about what a stock's fundamentals can do over a 3 to 5 year period so looking a bit further out than the average analyst or or the market looks to see what the medium term prospects are and what we generally find is if those prospects come through as hoped the market starts to pay up ahead of time so you don't have to wait the the whole 5 years to get the benefit of that 5 year improvement um in the fortunes of the company so the change in an industry or the change in the company we're looking for doesn't play out quickly, but often the change in the stock price plays out more quickly than that. Um, and I suppose actually the the super speeded up version of that would be actually if a acquirer actually sees the same prospects that we're seeing on a three to five year view, and they want to sort of pay for some of that up front. So actually, we have some shorter holding periods where effectively someone else realizes the same thesis and, and sort of short circuits that process that would normally play out more slowly. And a, a challenge with value investing, some say, is that when an investment goes right, you need to sell it for another. Do you agree that do you agree that this is a, a drawback? Yeah, no, it definitely is. So I think if you're a value investor in the way we're a value investor in terms of looking for companies that are undervalued compared to their prospects um, and therefore wanting to see a period of change play out to effectively correct that misvaluation, this is a process that then requires you to, to move on. So again, I think to do it well, 
um, particularly on a larger AUM. So we run about four billion pounds of AUM. You really need a team to help you because you need a lot of new ideas. So when you think about that average two, two and a half year holding period and a fund of 100 stocks, you're, you're needing sort of 30 to 50 new ideas per annum. And so I think you, you really need a big organization to successfully be able to run this process. Yeah, it, it's interesting that the portfolio is big. I, I was wondering if maybe having so many stops, is that, does that show how difficult it is to get right? I think, um, I think what's important is <clears throat> certainly we have a, a, a view on what a change should be in a company and what the catalyst for that change should be. But I think being able to call exactly when that's going to play out is particularly tough. So some things take a really long time. So again, some of our holdings have been in the fund sort of five or seven years um, because actually the process is taking a lot longer than we thought to play out or actually the change process is that much more powerful than we thought. So actually the, the performance from the stock can be more elongated. And so having a, a broad portfolio of a, 100 ideas allows you to be patient on each individual name. So effectively not trying to time the market to sort of see when things are, are going to turn around quickly, just being in a stock, as long as you see that the balance sheet's solid, you've got good downside protection from the valuation, will stick with a, a name, even if that change doesn't come through, um, as long as the potential for change is, is still there. And I think it's really important to be patient, particularly if you're you're investing down the market cap spectrum because some of these smaller names do take a while to get into because of liquidity as well. So ideally, we're almost always early on buying. We actually want the stock to underperform as we're buying it so we can average mm -hmm. down. Um, the last thing we want is actually things to work too quickly because then we've often got a subscale position and so the, the investors in the fund don't get uh, the whole benefit of a turnaround happening. And that makes sense. So are you... Do you work out what you think the price should be and then wait till the stops to get to that price? Yeah, so we've got a we've got a really big spreadsheet that I've been <laughs> populating sort of over the last 10 years that has about 500 companies on it now that basically sort of outlines what the company does, uh, why we think it's attractive and what we think the earnings of that company can be on a three to five year view. If that comes through, we then take a view on what multiple we think the market should pay for that. So compared to both the stock's own history, peers, the intrinsic growth rate of the, the company. Um, and then we monitor through time, are actually the earnings developing in the way we think? Um, and if the stock gets to that target price with the earnings that we expected, that's when we'll start to sell down. Now, often things play out differentially from what we originally thought. So we thought the margins were five and they could maybe get to 10. Actually, something has structurally happened in the industry that allows them to get to 15. So we will move the target price if we think the earnings power of the company is higher. I think what we're really careful not to do is change the multiple we'll pay for the company because I think the market is particularly bad at doing this. When things are going well, they think a company's great and therefore they think it's more highly valued, a better intrinsic company um, because things are going really well. They're beating earnings and they pay a higher multiple. And I think that's really, really dangerous. That's where you see that the big losses where investors, because things are going well today, they overpay for a company. And then actually, if there's any kind of setback, that's where you see the, the very big losses. So we're, we're very disciplined on the multiples we pay, but we're flexible on the target prices because fundamentals you can take a good guess at what things are going to happen over three to five years, but often they will play out differentially than you thought. Yes, no, that's a good point. And who knows, but we might be at the time in the cycle where people could be vulnerable to overpaying for certain stuff. Yeah, definitely. And 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 also we're very bottom up. So we don't <coughs> we don't the the economy can obviously be different through that period. So again, that's why it's good to have a hundred names so that we've got defensive ideas, we've got cyclical ideas, we have ideas with UK revenues. We have a lot of stocks with overseas revenues that the UK market itself has 60% of its revenues from from overseas. Sorry, actually the UK market 75%, the fund has 60% of its revenues overseas. So again, you get that diversification so that the fund can work in different economic environments, different FX environments, because we want the individual stock stories to be the power of the performance, not a macro factor that powers a, a certain area of the market. 
And there must be some cases where it doesn't come through and the stock doesn't re-rate as you're expecting. I was having a look through your holdings, and I'll caveat these are tiny holdings, but McColl's, Danny Gibbons, Rank Group might be examples of ones in Fidelity Special Values. How long are you prepared to hang on to a company until it comes right? So, so again, it, it's all about whether the upside thesis is still there and the downside protection is still there. So the thing that would make me sell out most if, if there's a negative change in what I thought was providing the downside. So particularly if there's some kind of issue that reveals a hole in a balance sheet of a company or trading so bad that they make losses that it actually impairs the, the balance sheet. Because I think in a turnaround, if you're uncertain of what the share count's going to be, it's very difficult to work out what the, the end um, return's going to be if the company's going, potentially going to have financial difficulties. So that would be a reason for selling out quickly, even if you've lost money, if the downside is impaired. Um, there's two reasons why positions may be small in the fund. So one, either I'm buying into the idea um, or the idea um, has has fallen in value substantially. So again, we don't look to have positions that are under 25 basis points because we don't think they're going to power performance. Some stocks will be there because I'm either buying in or selling out um, rather than as a long-standing position below 25 basis points. I think a really good example of of where we gave up on a stock was actually the, the long-standing position we had in Lloyd's post the financial crisis. So that, that was something that, that Sanjeev invested in and very much we bought into that thesis back in 2012 that the, the underlying ROE would improve as they cut costs, they built capital, um, that you saw loan losses fall. Um, and actually, at a headline level, that very much did come through. So the ROE of Lloyd's did move up from the single digits to about 16% at its peak in, in 2015. Um, as the bank really did optimize its cost base, uh, increase margins, and get the loan loss provisions down. Unfortunately, what we didn't perceive that very differentially for the UK banks compared to the US banks is that all those earnings that were generated were paid away in um, provisions, in Lloyd's case, primarily for PPI. So effectively, the headline profits of the business look good but the cash generation of the business was much lower than we expected. And that was a key reason why our Citigroup position worked really well. We made about a, a 50 to 70% return on that position, despite actually it headline delivering pretty much the same thing that Lloyd's did, um, a little bit better because US interest rates rose better through that cycle. In that case, even though we didn't make money in Lloyd's, the upside thesis very much went away because 16% return actually was pretty good on a global basis. Um, but the cash generation that we would have expected to be paid out in dividends or, or share buybacks wasn't paid back. And so actually, even though the fundamentals um, came through, the stock price didn't react because all that cash was paid away. And so we started reducing our Lloyd's position in 2014, 2015 on that basis um, and sold out finally in, in 2016. How often do things like that happen where a sort of re-rating doesn't come through? So thankfully, that's reasonably rare. So if the thesis actually plays out, um, that then generally, actually, the stocks will move um, because they, they, will pay, they will be able to pay that cash out. So I think that, that one where the, effectively there was a third-party drag on the cash that we didn't anticipate – is pretty rare because normally you, you don't get that kind of thing happening because we always analyze the balance sheet as it stands. And so that was effectively a sort of a, a third party impact that we underestimated. Those aren't that rare. What is much more likely is the stock doesn't work because actually our change thesis doesn't come through. So effectively, on a turnaround, um, I'd say probably only around 60% of the turnarounds work. Um, and you need to buy in before there's evidence because people are already paying for it once there's evidence. But the way we set up the fund means that we can be very successful, even though not all of the ideas work. Because as I was sort of saying before, if, if you buy in when consensus is negative, the stock's cheap because everyone thinks this is a bad company. And actually that consensus turns out to be right. That's what the stock was priced for. So as long as you haven't bought a bad balance sheet, um, you can largely sell the position again for not much less than you paid for it because people already negative. 
actually, though, if the turnaround happens, people weren't expecting that. So not only are the earnings much more, uh, much higher than people were expecting, the rating people pay for the stock is much higher. So the, the gain on the winners in the portfolio is much higher than the losses on the, the losers. Um, so we have a very asymmetric risk return profile in the, the holdings. That makes sense. And if you're right 60% of the time, that makes for a very successful fund manager. Um, you can shop across the market spectrum. You mentioned earlier that you sort of see value in small caps, and you often hear that because they're less well-researched. Um, they also tend to have higher valuations. Do you feel that you're always seeing better value in small cap or down the market cap spectrum? So th it's just a broader market as you go down the market cap spectrum. There's more stocks to, to choose from. Um, and so it's not that actually... Um, the small caps we own are more highly valued. There's just more dispersion of valuation. So the UK market at the top end doesn't have many very highly valued stocks, whereas you go into the mid and small cap part of the market, there are some extremely highly valued stocks. So the UK has stocks valued as highly as they, they are in the US. They're just not the same size of market caps. So I'd say actually value dispersion is much better in small caps um, than it is in large caps. There's a lot of cheap large caps, but some of those are quite poor companies that we don't want to own. Um, whereas in small cap, there's some very expensive companies, but also some very cheap ones. And then the key structural reason for being in small caps is, yeah, they're, they're less well-researched, so your chance of getting an edge is that much higher. So when there's 10 or 15 or 20 analysts looking at a mid-large cap position on the sell side, there may only be sort of two or three sell side analysts. Um, and particularly if you're in an unloved sector and an unloved stock, it's actually not unusual for there be, be sort of one or two analysts looking at a company and not looking at it very closely. So that's why we're, we're structurally overweight to that mid and small cap area. And both the funds are quite large. I guess this would be a more relevant question for the special situations fund. But do you ever run into liquidity problems for in the smaller cap so again the the funds even though they are mid and small cap biased um that's always been the case and indeed special situations has been much bigger in the past so under anthony the fund peaked at six billion pounds of aum and we're at three billion today partly that's because we we halved the fund when when anthony stepped down and created global special situations so you can certainly run this much money in mid and small caps um and indeed, compared to overall market levels, which are much higher than they were in, in 2006 when Anthony stepped down, there's still ample capacity. I think going back to right the beginning question, sort of value has been out of favour and the UK has been out of favour. So actually, if you market cap adjust how big special situations is today, it's about a billion pounds less than when I took it on in 2014. So there's been consistent outflows from the fund and the sector. So I have run effectively a billion pounds more than I do today in, in sort of real world money. So yes, it clearly you can't buy 100 million, 200 million pound companies in size with this much assets. But certainly when you're talking about 500 million or a billion pound companies, that that's no issue moving into those stocks. And also how we trade really helps liquidity because obviously if you're trying to chase what everyone else is chasing, a momentum strategy, buying into themes, clearly those mid and small cap stocks will be well bid and it'll be difficult to buy with the herd. But if you're buying against the herd when things are going wrong and people don't like the stock, um, it's much easier to buy. So effectively, you're, you're taking natural liquidity. And then if there's then a turnaround and actually things look like they're getting exciting and earnings are improving, there's lots of natural buyers. So again, being contrarian really helps with liquidity because you're buying when everyone else is selling and you're selling when everyone else is buying. So again, even though the turnover is high and we look at smaller stocks, that contrarian trading really helps and also means our trading costs are very low. So actually, there's been a number of years where our trading costs are actually negative because effectively, if you're buying while a stock's falling, you, you actually have a, a sort of negative implementation cost. Um, which is very different from from growth funds that can often have really quite high trading costs in the more mid and small cap space. Your fact sheet says you look for companies where there's limited downside risk. Um, I was looking at the performance and in the market sell off in 2020, the NAV actually fell by more than the benchmark index. Why do you think that happened? Yeah, so I think <laughs> I think what a lot of investors confuse is they think of volatility and risk as the same thing. And actually, they're very different. So 
what we're thinking about is ultimately what is the potential for permanent loss of investors capital in this investment so that's why we do a lot of work on balance sheets and think about can this company get into financial distress um, a lot of work on the valuation of the company um, even if the company's great if it's at a very high valuation you could see a huge permanent loss of capital um, but we do deliberately buy mid and small cap positions and also unusual complicated companies that don't have natural peers because again the market finds it tough to value those so that the valuation anomaly can be that much bigger so often what you see in a downturn people try and get out particularly of their more illiquid and smaller positions the stocks they they know less well uh, that 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 they're less confident in and so the volatility of the fund can be particularly high at those kind of moments um but that creates great opportunity. So this isn't a fund that you should invest in if you think you need the money in 12 months. This should be something you're in for at least three to five years, if not longer, because we're not looking to reduce volatility. We're not looking to buy um, sort of steady eddy companies. We're looking to buy companies where there is a degree of change and uncertainty. And when the market panics, there's the potential that this fund does worse than the market, as we saw in the, the COVID sell-off. But that was by far and away the greatest buying opportunity you've had in the, the last five years. If you bought when that occurred, you have got incredibly handsome returns. Yeah. And another thing that's driven handsome returns is M&A. And I imagine that's um, quite relevant to the types of companies you're looking at. How much of the performance has been driven by um, M&A and do you expect this to continue? Yeah, so um, hopefully, as I've explained, sort of in the process, we're, we're looking for things that we think are good franchises that the market isn't um, valuing as good franchises. And so normally the way that that would play out is that effectively the returns would improve and the market would again value them as, as good franchises going forward. But one way to short circuit that process is actually someone else recognises that this is a good franchise and, and they look to buy that when the, the market... Um, isn't paying up and i think particularly today because the uk market is still so lowly valued and other markets particularly the us market and also particularly private markets are very highly valued that that valuation discrepancy makes it particularly attractive for private equity and um, larger corporates often us-based corporates to buy uk assets today um so the fund has always had a number of takeover targets per annum, but actually in the last 12 months, we've had 10. So more than 10% of the, the fund receiving a takeover bid. So that is a pretty unprecedented level. And when you look at the, the identity of the takeover um, acquirers, they are primarily US-based corporates or private equity. So they effectively look at the multiples that are being paid in those markets. They're dramatically higher, 50, 100% higher than they are in the UK. So the broad swathes of the UK market therefore look very attractive and so I think that's why there is so much M&A um, it's also particularly focused in the more mid and small cap end it's much easier to acquire smaller companies than it is larger ones and so the fund has done particularly well and I think if we don't see unfortunately if we don't see a closing of this valuation gap I think you're just going to see more of this more of the UK market is going to disappear because it's just far too cheaply valued now, <clears throat> I think the good news is that UK continues to be a broad market. So we still have about 3,000 companies to choose from. So uh, we may have seen some of the fund sort of taken out, but there still are other opportunities to, to pick from. And then also, particularly because on the more mid and small cap stocks, because we have quite big positions, so we often have between 5 and 10% of a company, as long as at least two or three other shareholders also agree with that you don't have to accept these takeover bids so actually of those 10 bids um one of them spire healthcare uh, we were quite publicly against we talked to newspapers about why this undervalued the stock and thankfully tosca fund also agreed with us so actually that one failed whereas the other the other nine have gone through yeah it's, it's interesting you are a uk um stock picker but both of the funds have a reasonable allocation overseas you've got um Roche being an example, Sanofi listed in Europe. Uh, how do you see the rel relative attractiveness of UK versus Europe? Yeah, so the, the funds have the ability to invest up to 20% um, overseas, and we've regularly made a use of that, often sort of between sort of 15 and 18%. 
that has fallen more recently, actually, um, particularly as we sold out of Citigroup that did really well. That was a very big position historically. And then also we've reduced Roche quite a lot. So um, that was actually the fund's biggest position um, in April 2020, um, hitting about 6%, and that's down to about 2.5% of the fund's day. So we've got about 12% overseas today, with the biggest of the positions being Sanofi and Roche. And I think that <coughs> is a really good encapsulation of why we go overseas, because the European equity team, which is based, based here in London, covers pan-European equities and particularly in pharma this is a global industry with the US being the biggest market so the geographic exposure of Roche and Sanofi is almost identical to Astra and Glaxo but actually in that large cap market space while the UK is a very broad market and there's lots of mid and small caps to choose from if you want to own pharma in the UK you only really have two choices it's mm -hmm. it's uh, Astra or um, Glaxo and actually I don't own either for different reasons. I'd say Galaxo has a growth problem. It has a reasonably geared balance sheet and it doesn't have much of a pipeline. So its valuation is reasonably low, but there doesn't appear to be any significant positive catalysts and the balance sheet looks somewhat shaky. Um, whereas Astra, on the other hand, is doing very well on growth, but is very well priced, uh, a very high valuation reflecting their success. So whereas if you look at Roche and Sanofi, Sanofi, I'd say, is somewhat similar to Glaxo. It's on a very cheap valuation, about the same, but with a much better balance sheet and with one growth asset in the short term, a questionable mid-term pipeline, uh, but certainly growing strongly in the short term with a good balance sheet. So they're very much in there because I think they're more attractive than their UK peers in a sector where you have um, less choice. Great. Well, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you. I've just got one more question. Lots of our listeners are stock pickers. Could you give us two examples of UK holdings that you're most excited about? I think it might be have the biggest re-rating coming. It's always extremely tricky to just pick out um, one or two stocks because, as I said, that we're excited about the portfolio overall. But in terms of timing and when the market pays for things, it's it's know. really tough to say. So I'm always quite reticent to pick out a couple of individual stocks that we think are going to do well, particularly, say, if you're looking at a 12 month basis, because I think on a three to five year view that there's a lot of stocks that are going to work really well. But indeed, given historic hit rates, 40 percent of them aren't going to work. And it's the performance of the, the other two. So it's quite dangerous, I think, to only invest certainly on a value basis in a couple of stocks because the the chance of success is probably only 60 percent and it's about the percentage gain when you win so that's why i would say if you're investing personally and you want to invest in this kind of space you do want to be broadly based but it is hard because you're not going to be able to do all that due diligence to avoid those value traps so you're not going to give me any names <laughs> unfortunately not <laughs> That's okay. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Really enjoyed it.